HNMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Here I have a molecule of 112 trichloroethane. We can look at this and see that there's essentially two different hydrogen environments. That hydrogen with the two chlorines around it would be in a different environment than these hydrogens. And you might recall that the number of peaks in a HNMR spectrum reflects the number of environments. Hence, we see in this picture two peaks. The area under the peak, sometimes referred to as the integration peak, indicates the number of hydrogens in that environment. So the integration peak here is shown in red. So when I look at this, I can see from this integration peak that if I look at the number of hydrogens in this environment and compare them to the number of hydrogens that exist in this environment, there's probably twice as many hydrogens in this environment because the ratio of the peaks is approximately one to two. Further evidence that perhaps that the um, hydrogens exist in this environment can come from our IB data booklet. When we can look at the chemical shifts that are available, I think it's in table uh, 27 in the IB data booklet, and we can see that a halogen, in this case chlorine, connected to two hydrogens, which we have in this case, two hydrogens connected to chlorine, should exist somewhere between 3.5 and 4.4. So indeed, um, that's not too far off that particular range in there to there. So that's a quick review of what we learned in the standard level program. Today we're going to look a little bit more at something called higher resolution NMR data. So what we do now is we zoom in on these peaks that we have and take a closer look at what's generating them. So a closer look at those two peaks indicates that the taller peak generated by the hydrogens in what I call the B environment actually exists as two peaks and that the hydrogen A actually exists as three smaller peaks. This splitting pattern is used to give us information about the number of neighboring hydrogens. So let's look at how that works. The hydrogens that I'm describing present here in environment B, they are influenced by the presence of A. A somehow affects their environment. Let's look at how they do that. To generate a hydrogen NMR, we require an external magnetic field, which I'll indicate here by this large arrow. The hydrogens at A can be thought of as tiny magnets, each generating their own magnetic field based on how they spin. So I could have the hydrogens at A spinning in one direction, generating a magnetic field that aligns with the external, or the hydrogen at A could be spinning in such a way that it's against the magnetic field, the external magnetic field. Now, there's a 50-50 chance that it could be in either of these states. So 50% of the time it could be like this, 50% of the time it could be like this. So if I now look at the environment that's experienced by B, I have the external magnetic field as well as the magnetic fields that are generated by A interacting. So 50% of the time they could add and 50% of the time they could subtract. So I get this resulting magnetic field. So 50% of the time they add, 50% of the time they don't. As a result, I get a one-to-one -one ratio of these resulting magnetic fields, which I see here. There's a one-to-one -one ratio that exists in this external magnetic field that's generating this pattern. And they're of equal height because 50% of the time it could be in either state. So the environment at B has been infected by the states that A can possibly take on. Now let's reverse it a little bit and take a look now at how A is affected by the environments at B. So again I've labeled them here so I want to look at how these influence what's happening over here at A. Again I have my external magnetic field present. Now the hydrogens at B there are two of them so it could happen that both of these B's are generating a magnetic field 
that's in the upward direction. They could also be generating magnetic fields in the downward direction. And they could also be in states where they're opposite to each other. Now, how often do these happen? Well, these happen in a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. These are the possible times that this could happen. So what I have then is a 1 in 4 chance that they will add together strengthening this field. There's a 2 in 4 or 50 percent chance that these two fields will cancel out and this was all uh, the total magnetic field. Or they could both be aligned against it, again 25 percent of the time, subtracting from that field. So let's take a look at what that result looks like. So you can see here that I get three peaks. So I'm getting three peaks. One peak when the two add. Second peak is when the two cancel. That's this peak in here. And then I get a third possible peak when the two magnetic fields would be aligned against it. Now, as far as how often this happens, this happens in a one to two to one ratio. Hence, when you looked at the peak of A, we saw three peaks in roughly this ratio. So this gives us this rule that we use when we deal with splitting of um, the, the splitting pattern that generates. First of all, the number of peaks is governed by the number of neighbors plus one. So again, if I look back here at my example A, it has two neighboring hydrogens. Now, those two neighbors can therefore generate three environments, the n plus one rule. Now, the ratio of peaks is given by Pascal's triangle. Let's quickly review what that looks like. Pascal's triangle, one, 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 and then one. I add these two together, one and one gives me two, and one here, and then I get a one, add these two together, I get three, these two give me three, and this gives me one, and I'll even do a fourth row here, one, add these two together, a four, six, four, one. So if I plot here, or if I have here my number of neighbors, and the neighbors here refer to hydrogens. If I got no neighboring hydrogens, I'll have one single peak. If I have one neighboring hydrogen, I'll have two peaks in a one-to-one -one ratio. If I have two neighboring hydrogens, like in this case for A, they'll be in a ratio of one, two to one. Three neighboring hydrogens will generate this frequency and four and so forth. Let's put this into practice now in an example. Suppose I'm given the molecular formula of a compound and both the low resonance and the high um, resolution NMR. So let's look at some possible structures that this could have. Um, well, first of all, I can recognize that it's not a saturated compound because if it was saturated, there would be 10 hydrogen. So there's probably a double bonded oxygen in this. So with that in mind, one possibility might be a aldehyde. I could perhaps get an isomer of this aldehyde. And I could also get a ketone. So let's examine these three possibilities and the low resolution nuclear magnetic resonance. I can notice here the presence of three peaks. Now if I take a look at my first model, there's one hydrogen environment these two would be in a second, these would be in a third, 
and I've even got a fourth environment out here. So clearly this doesn't match. Now this molecule, however, does also have three environments. So those environments would be equivalent to these environments. And this hydrogen would have its own unique environment as with this one. So this one has three environments which matches the profile I have here. And likewise, these hydrogens, and I'll label these A, 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 um, B, B, and C, C, and C. So this also has three environments in it. Now, the next thing I'll look at is the ratio of the areas here. If I take a look, this uh, ratio for this line and this line appear about equal, and this one appears a bit shorter. So with 8, I'm going to go something like a 2, 3, 3 ratio. And I can see from that that this one unfortunately falls out of the picture, leaving me with this final structure being most likely. Now let's take a look at the high resolution and see how that works out. If I take a look at this first peak, it's caused by a triplet. So that must mean that there's hydrogen, there must be two neighboring hydrogens. So if I take a look at the structure here, the hydrogens at C have two neighbors. So the hydrogens here at C experience two neighboring hydrogens. And those two neighbors would generate a one, two, one ratio. So these are probably the hydrogens at C. If I take a look at the hydrogens at B, the hydrogens at B have three neighbors. So these have three neighboring hydrogens. Having three neighbors, I would expect a one, three, three, one, four peaks. So this is probably then the hydrogens at B. The hydrogens at A, out here on the periphery of the molecule, this carbon has no hydrogens. So this one has zero neighbors. So I would expect but one peak indeed, which is what I have here. So this then corresponds to the hydrogen at A. So further evidence that we have the correct structure. So this brings us to an end of the core material. In our next series of programs, we'll take a look at some of the option areas. Thanks again for watching.